Hello and welcome back to video number three in which we'll be looking at why mollusks are useful to us as geologists and also what they look like when we find them in a rock. So let's start with this latter bit. What do mollusks look like when we actually find them in uh, earnest in the field? So I, I've tried to build up here um, based on my experience a general rule of thumb as to what um, you maybe look, want to look out for. Uh, when you're doing field work and you're trying, coming across these these rocks, uh, sorry, these fossils in rocks in the field, and based on that experience, so again, these are rules of thumb. Um, there'll be some exceptions. Uh, my experience tells me that ammonites are actually usually quite distinctive. They are relatively rarely highly fragmented, and indeed sometimes you get famous beds, which we'll, we'll return to this, in which they are concentrated, such as the blue lias in Dorset. Um, so. And, and when you see those, actually, it's really, really quite obvious that what you're looking at is an ammonite. You can see an example here on the top left. So even in these slightly more ropey um, fossils, you can see the exterior of the shell. You can see that coiling and you can see some of the ribs on the outside of the shell. And that's often a giveaway for uh, being able to um, identify an ammonoid. Gastropods, too, are also quite distinctive, typically. Sometimes the rock can break across them at an angle, and then you'll see something such as you see uh, in this image here. But because of that coiling and the fact they're often this conical shape, um, you will often, uh, in fact, almost universally be able to tell what you're looking at, no matter what angle you cut it at, is a gastropod nice and easy. Remember though, um, the examples of um, molds and casts from the first lecture, and the fact that we quite often with these um, organisms get internal molds. And so you get this kind of like spiral shape without any kind of morphology associated with the outside of the shell. So um, just remember, if you see something like that, that again, you're looking at a gastropod, it's just that you're looking at the internal mold of that shell, right? Um, so kind of important to remember that those exist. Belemnites, you can see a nice example here on the bottom left. These creatures look a lot like bullets. Um, the key thing to this is that, uh, in addition to looking like bullets, they're made of calcite, and sometimes you break them in section, and you can see radially arranged calcite crystals a lot of the time. So this means that eat, no matter what angle you cut them at, if you've got all of these uh, radially arranged, ooh, where do I need to get, there we go, radially arranged calcite crystals going around a central point, this may well be a belemnite. Okay, and obviously that only applies to rocks that are um, around the uh, Mesozo Mesozoic when these creatures were around. Definitely not in those post-KG, um, sorry, post-KPG extinction. In contrast to those three, in my experience, I most often see bivalves as highly fragmented shells. Um, often in shell beds like the one you can see here on the right, which I've taken from this, uh, this paper here, it's a really useful um, example, where you see little bits of fragments of the shell. These ones are show nice ribs that helps you identify them. And concentrations like that are not infrequent. Often um, they won't be quite as concentrated as this, but still you just get these fragments of shells uh, arranged at all angles. As long as you have a good portion of the shell present, you can normally tell from sight if it's a bivalve. We'll cover how to tell these apart from other similar looking shellfish um, in future lectures. So um, shell fragments you can normally tell apart on the basis of a relatively small amount of the shell based on their symmetry. In section, mollusks look a lot like you can see on this slide here. Again, ammonites are quite distinctive in section, be that a, uh, a section down the middle. This one is actually in cross-polar light, and you can see it's been recrystallized in calcite. Or if you're chopping them um, a, a kind of down the shell, so you're seeing a, a cross-section of the shell that includes a number of different whorls. So you can see that example of such a cut here. So everything between those two extremes of angle are possible and indeed it's possible in a rock, but all of them are quite distinctive. Gastropods are primarily um, aragonitic, and in fact so are ammonites uh, in terms of their original, um, uh, their original biomaterial, but that will often recrystallize or recrystallize or be replaced by calcite, which is quite common as it's more stable. So the same, the same point actually applies to both of these 
um, groups. They were originally aragonite, often they'll be replaced by calcite. The internal microstructure of the shells is usually not preserved and normally it's replaced with uh, calcite in both of those groups. Gastropods are recognized in thin, thin section by their shell morphology, which is distinctly curved um, and spirals around a central axis. You can see a really nice example of this here. So you've got this apex um, and, um, and curvature that you can see um, no matter really how you cut the gastropod. So this is the aperture. We're looking towards the bottom of a shell right here in this example. So the more of these rocks you see, the easier it will become to identify these things in cross-section. Bivalves were originally aragonitic and consist of several layers of internal microstructure, but again, this may be lost through time and replacement to calcite. The most common structure observed in bivalves is an inner layer, which is composed of sheets of aragonite, and then an outer layer of aragonite or calcite, kind of more um, crystalline uh, calcium carbonate. Um, but again, sometimes you see that being replaced fully with, um, with calcite. So that's a quick whistle-stop tour of what these things look like, both in the rocks, which I think is probably going to be more useful to you than understanding potentially what they look like in section. But here is an example. So the key question that we're trying to keep, cover in this um, course is why they're useful to you as geologists. So I'm a paleontologist, right? I'm a paleobiologist. I love the, the biology of these things. But even if you don't, even if you, you're not interested in how these things live their lives, say, um, they're really useful to us as geologists because they help us understand the rocks that, um, that we're, they're found in. Now, because bivalves have a wide range of life strategies, um, and associated with those relationships to particular sediments, this means that they're really good fossils for identifying facies, depositional environments within our sedimentary rocks. Um, so I've put an example on the left here of using bivalves and a number of other fossils um, to understand the depositional environment within a sedimentary basin uh, in India. So this is a kind of a, a a series of environments where the authors have been able to identify, for example, the depth of the water based on the fossil assemblage um, that was present in that rock. So bivalves in any particular area are actually quite good for this. If you are having to do that though, you'll obviously need to research the bivalve and other fossil assemblages in this area to build up a picture of what they're telling you. They can also tell us a lot about, for example, the substrate conditions in which the organisms were living, whether it was soft or already cemented based on the fauna that were there. Generally, both bivalves and um, gastropods are not so useful for biostratigraphy, which we introduced last lecture with respect to the trilobites. Some pelagic bivalves are used for this in the uh, Triassic, but for a number of reasons, they're not always top-notch or the best fossils that we have to allow us to correlate layers of rock, though sometimes needs must so they are used. I also want to highlight that bivalves in shell beds, and the same with gastropods, can be used as a way up structure. So this can be, in the case of both bivalves or gastropods, when they contain geopetal structures. This is when a shell is part filled with sediments and mineral deposits can fill them halfway up and this will allow you to look at the space versus the deposit and tell what way up the rock originally was. Also in terms of bivalves, um, in, if you have a concentration bed of bivalves we can tell through their dominant direction which way up the rock was likely to have been deposited in. Most of these um, come to rest if there is wave action with the convex, so the curved face uppermost, um, because they're more stable in that direction. And so when there's a when you've got lots and lots of these shells, you can look at them and say most of them are pointing this way. Therefore, the rock was probably deposited this way up. So these um, these creatures are really good as way up structures, which is nice. So that's cool. But I wanted to finish talking about the key thing that um, mollusks can add to our life as geologists, in particular the cephalopods, and this is namely with Mesozoic biostratigraphy. So that is biostratigraphy, which we learnt about um, last lecture and in the Zoom session, um, and that within the uh, Mesozoic uh, rocks uh, into, uh, of the world. Right? 
And the am ammonites, sorry, the ammonoids, I should say, are absolutely key fossils for allowing us to unravel the biostratigraphy of the Triassic, Jurassic, and Cretaceous time periods. So we introduced the basics of biostratigraphy last lecture, and we're going to continue just kind of building on that knowledge as these lectures uh, continue over the course of the next few videos. And we discussed what a biozone was in a little more, more detail in our Zoom session. Um, if you'll remember, recall, a zone is named after a fossil. So, right, so one zone has one fossil. And this is known as an index fossil. I've put a uh, definition on this slide for you here, but it's really simple. It's a fossil whose presence is chosen to denote the zone in which it occurs, and after which that zone is named. So, there are a number of things that make a good index fossil, and we're going to go over that for the next few slides, along with why the ammonites are particularly um, good as zone fossils. So it's a double whammy of learning what makes a good zone fossil and why ammonites are this. So the first thing that makes a good zone fossil for us is it must be in a lineage that evolves rapidly, and so any given uh, zone fossil um, was around for a short time range. So in terms of general biostratigraphy, you may be wondering what a short time range actually means. So, well, in the Cretaceous, the recent, um, there are 70 biozones, mostly of microfossils, that have an average duration of 2 million years per biozone. Um, in older rocks, obviously, it's a bit harder um, to divide these up into small um, time zones because we've just got fewer fossils in many of these and fewer of those rocks. And so, in low, for example, the Lower Paleozoic, this is generally divided into 39 conodont biozones, which have an average duration of 3 million years. A bit longer and not ideal. On this slide, you can see a really nice example of why ammonites are super cool for this. So these are Cretaceous zones built from ammonites. And you can see that in these bad boys, we can go down to, some, in some cases, 1 million years in terms of um, the, the duration of the zone. So in terms of the absolute numbers that I'm giving you, that comes from calibrating these zones using uh, radio uh, metric dates based on, for example, ash beds associated with, with rocks from this time period. So ammonites uh, do evolve very, very quickly, and that makes them really good at zone fossils. Ideally, a zone fossil should have a distinctive morphology that makes it easy to identify. You don't want to have confusion over whether you're looking at zone fossil A or zone fossil B, especially if these existed um, close to each other uh, in time. This is true in ammonites, thanks to their sutures uh, and their septal structure. So on the, um, the uh, slide you can see here, this is actually a 3D digital model of the septor of some ammonites derived through a high resolution form of CT scan and published in the paper that you can see here. So you've got this really, really complex shape, and quite beautiful shape, I think, of the scepter that make very, very distinctive suture lines um, when they hit the outside of the shell. And this means that ammonites are very distinctive and are very easy to identify, even in fragmentary fossils. Um, so that makes them, again, really good index fossils. <clears throat> so that was point number two about what makes a, a good index fossil. Point number three is that a good index fossil should ideally have a wide geographic distribution. A fossil is of far less use to us as a zone fossil if it was only found in one particular region of one particular sedimentary basin at one time in the geological past. Obviously, if you're working on that particular sedimentary basin, that means that it could be useful to you, but if we're talking about trying to correlate it across um, kind of like very different um, geographic regions, wide geographic distribution is key. This does vary with the application. So um, often individual basins will have their own biostratigraphy, and if there's oil in that their basin, um, then people will still work quite hard to understand the biostratigraphy of that localized zone. But um, for questions that are global in form, or for global aging of rocks, um, you do need this wide distribution, and this works really well with the ammonites because they were pelagic. 
They were swimming creatures, and thus they spread far and wide. So you can see an example of how widespread they are, where um, significant occurrences of um, a group of ammonoids have been mapped onto a uh, early Permian paleo map. And this is drawn from a paper from 2015. You can see that actually you've got this nice global distribution of the ammonoids in this time period. So again, that's good for making them plain fossils. Super. Ideally, what you would want for a good zone fossil is also for it to be facies independent. You don't want it particularly to be tied to a particular depositional environment, which is why uh, bivalves are potentially less strong as zone fossils than, for example, the ammonites. Um, so you want your zone fossil to appear in a wide range of different lithologies and different paleoenvironmental settings. Uh, my, my picture here is Nautilus. Um, but the same is true of ammonites, and we know that these creatures, based on um, drawing parallels between nautilus and ammonites, they were swimmers. They're not tied to a particular deposition environment. When they, um, when they die, they may float around for a while, but then eventually sink, and that will happen in any given depositional environment. Um, that doesn't, of course, mean that there aren't biases at play, but it does mean that they have this widespread um, kind of uh, distribution and, and they're not strictly reliant on a particular kind of rock to be preserved. So that's great. Nice. Well done. Then for having this nice external shell and indeed good preservation potential. And finally, what we want in a good index fossil, so this is point number five, I think at this point, is we want high abundance. We want loads of these things. This makes it more likely that you will find one of these fossils um, when conducting a study. Um, and it makes them a, a quicker and easier tool to use for biostratigraphy. Because of ammonite's high preservation potential, um, this is generally true. They are quite abundant. Um, th the example here is that rock layer I mentioned earlier called the Blue Lias from Dorset. And if you actually look at the rock here, you can see all these circular round structures there. Each one of those is actually a fossil ammonite. It's packed full of these um, creatures. And that's just an example of, uh, of one admittedly concentration bed, but one um, uh, kind of example of, of where we can expect um, to find these ammonites and that they are abundant in a variety of different rock types and that makes them really useful to us as zone fossils. So that was a crash course introduction to the mollusks. I hope it was interesting. Um, I will put some uh, 3D uh, models on the website for you to uh, help get build up a, a kind of a broader picture of what these creatures look like as fossils and we can talk a bit more about biostratigraphy in our zoom session but with that i'll leave you for the moment and i will catch you sometime soon thank you for your attention during the last three videos